Okay, so we're going to continue our teaching concerning neo-evangelicalism. So as you might recall, neo-evangelicalism is a term that's referring to the newer generation of the evangelical Christian churches. Now, you might remember concerning about the evangelical type of churches. That's a phrase that's been commonly used. And you may have heard that term, evangelical Christian church, right? So this is usually used as a negative connotation in the liberal world. Now, the evangelical Christian church is where we all come from. But the reason why there are so many different denominations of churches that have fallen into apostasy and that are not Bible-believing is because they follow the trend of the modern form, the neo, the new form. Hence, neo-evangelicalism. If you look at the early 1900s and 1800s, you might recall that the dressing, that the preaching, the worship music, and everything was traditional and very, very different. Things have changed so much. Why? Because we adapted to the modern generation and the culture of today. So that is very important to understand that adapting to the world system was what contributed to the fall of Christian churches today. And if you're going to look at the 10 largest churches in America, they're not Catholic churches, they are not Muslim mosques, they are not Jewish synagogues, and they are not Seventh-day Adventist churches or Mormon churches. They are our kind of churches, evangelical Christian churches. So then you would see that Satan's contribution and corruption is more so in this movement more than any other religion. You might say, then it's our fault for this Laodicean apostasy. You're absolutely right. Amen. It is our fault. I preached a sermon on that Sunday, which I encourage you all to watch, actually. It's a very important lesson. I hope it will be eye-opening to you. But anyway, we covered one of the issues concerning the evangelical or neo-evangelical churches. And number one was considered their dressing. Their dressing. Now, because... These topics are going to be touchy and I'm sure will address your concerns. You've got to understand this. The reason why it will address your concern is because you think that it's a part of your culture, your life now. We're not the type of church that bashes people on the head about this kind of manner concerning the dressing. The reason why is because, trust me, like 99% of the members came in like you did. They didn't dress like me when they came to church, for crying out loud. You know why? Because this kind of stuff is totally new. And not only that, this is something that I can't convince you. This is something that you have to pray to the Lord, and you have to have the guts to study the Scriptures for yourself. I mean, we live in an independent, critical mindset, right? Why not use that? Instead of being a robot just going with the flow and then going by feelings and getting upset at everything, right? So use your independent critical mindset and start studying and start asking questions and even come to me about that, which I am very open to. And my church members know about this too because they had the same concerns like you did. The dressing is the problem and the other one is music. Those are the two biggest things that is part of our culture and modernism that has ruined churches that Satan successfully used. That's why Hillsong is huge. That's why Joel Osteen's church service is huge. So you got to understand that. Now, in order to cover this is not by just traditional Baptist distinctives or what Gene Kim says. we got to look at the scriptures. Amen. So I covered one issue is concerning about immodest apparel where it stimulates lust, right? So we covered the verses on that one, and I convinced you of that. And then we went halfway through concerning about universal appearance. So that was the second issue. So we already covered the first issue, which I won't cover. It's concerning about lustful, immodest appearances. The second one now is universal appearances. Now we are covering some of the excuses that neo-evangelicals or even you might use. And the reason why I say why you might use is because, sadly, you've been affected by this culture and modernism that it hurts your flesh. Because it hurts the flesh, naturally, these excuses and arguments will come out. And I'm not saying, and I'm not getting hard on you for bringing up these excuses. I'm just simply pointing out that's how ingrained our flesh has been built. So I can't really blame you for that. 
Okay, so let's look at some passages over here. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and then verse 14. Now, here's a third argument that they're going to use concerning defending universal appearances. So, Pastor, you say that men are not supposed to have long hair, but how long is long hair? <laughs> That's the common question. How do you know long hair is not up to the neck or to the waist? How long is long? We live in that generation. All right, let's look at the context of verses 4 and 15, shall we? The context of verses 4 and verse 15. Now, let me tell you this. Before we even cover the verses, all I can say is this. If you are applying for a job and you really, really want this job badly, and then they just simply said that, hey, we want uh, men to have short hair, clean cut, and stuff like that, and they simply gave it out like that, you know what? you're going to do? You're not going to fuss and whine. Well, wait, how long is long? No, if you really want that job and you want to please uh, the leader where you can make a good impression, you're going to do it and you know what to do. Yes. Now, if you think like that with the earthly human sinner, you can't do that for the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Uh, yeah. So it shows how much you want to please your earthly boss yeah. for a worldly job mm -hmm. rather than your heavenly father for a heavenly task and reward and job he's given to you. You know what your job and task is? Representing him. Yep. All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And then we'll read verse 14. Verse 14. The Bible says, doth not even, what does it say? Nature itself. So you do know. It's something of common sense. Nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame to him. Now look at the context of verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a what? Covering. Covering. So notice right here that this is referring, if you were going to take common sense, of uh, verse 14 and verse 15, it has to do something that would cover your head. That's the idea what it's showing right here. Now, Something that you got to understand is this, is that do you honestly think that when a man walks into a barber shop with hair covering his nose, that the barber, who knows more about hair than you actually, the barber would know, about, would know more about hair than you, is going to say, wow, that's some short hair you got? Okay, so use your head. So even a person who knows, a, who majors and has a lot of work experience with hair, knows what long is and what short is. The only people who don't is people who have been ingrained by a system where they want to keep it at the length of their long hair. See that, man? Okay, here's a fourth argument that they might use. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses, we use 14 and, six, uh, 14 and 15, thank you so much. So that's a passage that you're going to have to use to show that you do know from the context right here that it's covering the head. And if you don't know what the head is, my advice is just look at a dictionary. What do you think the head is? Now use your head after that. You have your nose, you have your lips, you have your chin. That's all part of your head, okay? If you cover that, that's not covering the head. So you got go to a barber shop if you don't know that much about hair. Look at a dictionary if you really don't know what an English word means. And I think you got to look at verse 14 and check your mental stability about doth not nature itself teach you. Yes. Okay? Now, I know that this might sound a little strong and mean to you, but the reason why I'm putting this hard on you is because I'm trying to get into that flesh where we're all ingrained in. We need it. We need it. Where we're all ingrained in. I'm trying to hit that over there. Okay, so... The common excuse, obviously, is that Jesus and Samson had long hair. So that's another argument they're going to use. Look at Leviticus chapter 19, please. We're going to look at Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Maintain those two passages. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27, and 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. All right, so notice that in this passage right here, that Jews in the Old Testament, they did have long hair. 
The Bible does show that, actually. It was part of their society, their culture, and system. Look at Leviticus chapter 19, and then we'll read verse 27. So that's why Jesus Christ, he had long hair, and Samson as well. So that would be the excuse for Christians, why don't I do the same thing? And that's why during the hippie movement, Calvary Chapel grew so big because they, uh, the guy who founded Calvary Chapel... Chuck Smith, he was working with hippies, and then they all want to, and they all put Jesus as some hippie figure. So then with their beards and long hair, they feel like, hey, Jesus <clears throat> was a hippie like me. So they thought that they could blend in like that. But no, that's just trying to fit in with their culture of that generation, that time, the 60s and 70s. And they just happened to find some biblical figure that matched with their culture and generation that they want to look like. And that's what people do. What you're going to do is you're going to find something in the Bible that suited your fleshy taste that you're used to. Amen. And then by justifying your argument by that, then we know that that's a fleshy motive. Mm -hmm. And that's something you've got to judge your heart in. Okay, so look at Leviticus 19.27. Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. So see, you've got to look like a hippie, they might say. During that time, that's how the Jews dressed. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. You know what the simple answer to that is? Well, if you continue to read Leviticus chapter 19, what it's going to teach you is that, and the rest of Leviticus, it's going to teach you that if you take God's name in vain, you're supposed to stone people to death. It's also going to say that if you find someone who committed adultery or homosexuality, you are to stone them to death. It will also say that you're not supposed to wear mixed fabric. So you know what the simple answer to that is? The simple answer to that is that that's Old Testament law that does not apply to us. We're New Testament Christians. That's the idea. So what you're going to do is, if you see something at the Old Testament that conflicts with New Testament, what are you going to do? You're going to go by the New Testament. Unless... If you're so used to how your flesh is appearing and how you're feeling, you're going to work your way around it, aren't you? See, the reason why I'm trying to be hard right now is try to hit that unconscious mind where your flesh is so ingrained into. Okay, so let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. We read that. Doth not nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Now make your choice after that. So we are New Testament Christians. We're not under the Old Testament. That's a simple answer. Okay, let's also turn to this same passage with the fifth argument used by neo-evangelicals. They're going to use examples like George Whitfield and John Wesley and famous Great Awakening revival preachers who had long hair. So why can't I? <laughs> So if you looked at, uh, we admire and we brag a lot about John Wesley's preaching, George Whitfield. And Jonathan Edwards, who preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. But then they all, wore, uh, they all had this long hair. So then why can't we do the same thing? Well, you know what the simple answer to that is? The simple answer to that is we follow what the Bible says, not what men do. <laughs> There's your simple answer. What are you going to do if Pastor Kim smokes pot? You're all going to smoke pot? <laughs> hey, what if I got caught, caught with adultery? Is that something that you guys are going to do too? See, that's a simple answer. Look, you can't just... <laughs> Do you think every man is Jesus Christ? Obviously not. So you just follow what the Bible says. It makes me wonder why you would bring up George Whitfield, John Wesley, and not what the Bible says. It makes me see where your heart is. See, you still have a fleshy issue. That's your problem. By the way, the simple answer to that is this. The simple answer to that is, I think even in some countries they do this, where if you go to judges, they would have this long hair or wig. The reason why they had that was it was a position of power and authority. So that's the reason why they wore that, is, to, is a position of power, authority, and leadership. That's the reason why they had it that time. So that's why judges or pastors or people who spoke on a platform or, pu or pulpit, they all wore that. And I think some countries still do that today, actually. So you got to think about the cultural context of that time. But what do you think what happened at the 60s and 70s? What do you think the cultural context of that time was, right? And then think about the cultural context of today. It's so obvious. 
You just want to look like the world. So you got to realize this. Besides, even if I'm wrong about what I just stated about cultural context, you got to look at the scripture. Just look at the scripture and don't get mad at me. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, in this kind of teaching and preaching, the kind of pastor that I am that you're going to notice is that I'm not going to put on a facade for you. Amen. I'm going to be real with you. Yeah, no, that's why I don't want to be fake to you. I want to be real with you. And then, you know, when I talk to you all personally, I do it with wisdom and kindness and understanding. Why? Because, uh, look, I've been to school at Berkeley. All right? So I know the kind of mindset. And I can work with those kind of people. But if I'm going to preach on a pulpit, this... Right over here, I'm preaching God's word, and I'm not going to put on a facade yeah. for you. Yeah. Amen. That word of God has weight and power, yeah. and whether you like it or not, I'm just going to do it. Amen. All right, let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, and then we'll read verse 24. Ephesians chapter 4, and then we'll read verse 24. Now we're going to cover uh, the second issue, and that is concerning... So remember, there are basically four rules. We're at the third one. One is, is that you avoid lustful, immodest dressing, universal appearances. The third one is basically punk fashion. That's something you got to understand. Some people ask me, Pastor, I know that tattoos are bad, but can you give me a scripture on that one? Well, to be quite simple, you don't have to find a verse in the Bible like the book of Leviticus about markings on your skin. You don't have to pull up a specific verse where it says this specific item of dressing is wrong. Like I told you before, God didn't give all those specifics in his book because everybody of different times and cultures were dressed differently, right? But these four things, when you look at the scripture and check your heart on why you dress up in those things and the historical background of those things, then you know plainly from scripture which items to avoid. You don't need to be a genius. You don't need to ha be an independent, fundamental Baptist school where we're going to put like 50 pages on items on the, the, the color of your shirt. And then, the, uh, you know, you got to button up all the way to the top of your shirt. And then you have a Mormon handbook that you have to have black socks, uh, white, uh, you have to wear black socks that matches with your black pants and something ridiculous like that. Right. You don't need that. Right. You just need... These four areas from Scripture, and trust me, the specifics will come out. Yeah. And then you're going to see people dressed differently in church, not dressed all the same. Not all like some robot manner, like it's, it's, like, a, uh, let's, it's like a school uniform dress code. Yeah. See, it's not going to be like that. But it's gonna, they're all going to be dressed dri differently, but God honoring in these four areas. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's look at Ephesians 4.24. And that he put on the new man, right? Isn't that what God wants in our life? Right. When you put on something, it's got to be the new man, something spiritual. But not what? Which, after God, is created in what? Righteous. Righteousness and what? True. True holiness. So when you put on something, it's got to be something holy. Let me ask you a simple question. Is punk holy? If you're going to be very honest. Very, very honest. Does punk mean holiness? And then you think that it glorifies God when you come out like Toby Mac and then you dress up like that? Is that holiness? I mean, Matt, Toby Mac claims that he prays and then it gets kind of scary where he's inspired. It's practically like he's inspired by God when he writes out the lyrics and sings for the Lord. That's scary. And then you come out dressed like that. Because you're claiming that's all of God putting on the new man, God. You're claiming that. And that's scary to me. If you don't know what punk means, I would encourage you to just even look at a dictionary. We live in a day and age we don't even know what the word means. Yeah. All right, so here's from the Oxford Pocket Dictionary of Current English. So I pick current English. That way you, you don't think that, well, today's standard is different. No, this is current English. What well, we would modernize it as, as punk. Quote, a criminal, hoodlum, or passive male homosexual. <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm, I'm quoting you from the Oxford Pocket Dictionary of Current English. Now, now, 
think about it, if you're going to think about these specific items of punk fashion, see if it does match with criminal, hoodlum, passive male, homosexual. Think about that. All you have to do is just Google it, just type down punk fashion, and look at all these images that you see. How about that? Wearing ripped jeans, tattoos, spiked hair, mohawk, bleached hair, dyed hair, chains, bondage clothes, piercings, and you're going to find those items in punk fashion. Yeah, that's right. Now, let me, let me ask you this. If you see some of these people who are criminals, hoodlums, or even passive male homosexuals, would you happen to catch them wearing some of these items? And you should think and pray about that. See, we've just lost our common sense today. So when you come to this church, you got to realize this, is that when you come to this church with dyed hair, and then you come to this church with a piercing on your nose, and when you come to this church with ripped jeans and something like that, you should think twice and think, is this holiness to God? Okay, so sometimes we don't even understand the definition. So here's a book called The Encyclopedia of Hair. All right, I'm pulling up sources where people majored and study on, on fashion and hair and etc. okay? This is by Victoria Chereau, pages 318 to 319. If you look under the fashion list, there's an item of dressing called punk. And it quotes in this way what punk is. Chains, spiked leather jackets, safety pins, body piercing, tattoos. Yes, James White and Jeff Durbin. Bondage pants were part of the look. Hair was dyed with vivid shades of green, pink, Dark blue, orange, red, purple, and combinations of colors. <laughs> Some people preferred a dramatic pitch black color or they bleached their hair. Punk clothing and hairstyles were adapted into mainstream fashion. Celebrities and others. See, that's where the modern generation get their ideas of dressing from. What they looked at the magazines. Celebrities and others could be seen wearing punk hairstyles ripped jeans, body piercings, clothing fastened with safety pins, and other parts of the look. Some people wear punk-inspired in hairstyles, vivid hair accents, and fashions today. Now, don't get mad at me. I'm reading from an unbeliever, okay? I'm reading from an unbeliever. Okay, here's another uh, quote. It says, Quote, how to punk fashion and style. Okay, how to do it. Learn how to make some fun and outrageous punk looks for all ages. All right. Now, you know what kind of following punk clothes are shown from various articles and pictures? This is what they show. Big hold earrings, basically those piercings, you know. You ever seen that? I don't know all these exact wordings now, you know, where they put like pipes in the ears and then the ears like drag down like this. And then earrings over the top of the ears as well. Bleached hair, mohawks, bondage pants, tongue piercings, lip piercings. I think I said bondage pants over here. I don't know why I wrote it twice. But you'll see right here that in this source that they gave how to punk fashion and style over here. Now look at Romans chapter 12 and 1 Peter 3. Romans chapter 12. And 1 Peter chapter 3. Romans chapter 12 and 1 Peter chapter 3. Here are some other verses that you'll need to know that will be very helpful to you. First Peter chapter 3. You're going to need to know these verses. That will be helpful for you on right dressing. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Notice the Bible says, And be not conformed to this what? World. world. See, God does not want you to conform to the way that the world would dress. Now look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. Notice the Bible says, Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, 
even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, here's something that you got to realize is that, so we see Romans chapter 12, God does not want you to adapt or follow the world. The Bible also shows that 1 Peter 3, God does not want you to dress in a way where you're deliberately attracting attention. Now, here's something you got to ask yourself. Do you wear that certain style or clothing so that you can look like a beautiful movie star or fit in with your worldly friends or attract attention? That's something you got to ask yourself. By the way, I took psychology classes in graduate school, so don't say that I don't know what I'm talking about. But in the DSM, where they uh, show the diagnosis of some teenagers who are suicidal, depressed, you know why they put piercings on themselves? Come on, come on. To attract attention. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Now look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, you notice that if I keep teaching and preaching about this, that I am going to be even a smaller church, and I'm going to have more people angry at me. And do you think that I honestly want that? I obviously don't. You know, I already got enough of a headache taking care of the church. Do I need more? No, I don't want that. So why would I teach that if I don't want that? See, the thing is, is that... that there it shows that your pastor, he wants to be real with you and honest with you and show you the truth from the Bible, Amen. even if he doesn't want to. Yeah. Amen, and if you want that kind of a church and that kind of a pastor and that's the kind of teaching you want to hear, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. Amen. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Now this, will, this one, and I showed you Romans 14 before, right? These two verses are the best where you can really... Find out the specifics of dressing, and I don't have to tell you. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 22. The Bible says, abstain from what? All, All appearance of evil. It's not just abstaining from evil itself. Well, this is not really evil, so I can wear it. No, does it even appear as evil in a way? Does, does it even appear as evil in a way. If you're wearing some style or clothing that looks a little bit like punk fashion, then you're sinning right there. I mean, one time when I was going shopping, you know, with my parents, I saw this jacket and it really looked nice and I wanted to buy it. And it's not like a punk jacket, but you know what? Because it had that like that fur around the neck and it did look kind of like a rock star, a little bit kind of a look. You know, I was in doubt and I was questioning. And you know what your pastor did as a godly, holy person? I got it. <laughs> and then I had to have a second set of eyes to judge me. And then that second set of eyes told me, why do you want to look like a rock star? And I was like, you know, I thought of that in my head. So this person already thought of me that way. So that alone was sufficient where I shouldn't dress that way. See that? The, why am I giving my example right here? Because it's ingrained in our flesh. Yeah, we though. want to look like the world in some way, yeah. even though we try to, well, you know, I'm going to try to dress white, right? And maybe it's compromising a little bit, but it's not really, so I'll buy it. So I'm giving a good, clear, specific case in my case. That way you can apply it in your life and be more careful on how you dress. Because this is, if this is ingrained in your pastor, I know for a fact this will apply to all of you as well. We're all going to come across this in our lives. That's good, preacher. Amen. All right. Now, let's look at another argument right here. 1 Samuel chapter 16. This is the famous passage that new evangelicals will use to justify their dressing and appearance. And some onliners have told me about this, which is not a surprise because it's a common argument. One, one of the onliners mentioned, I told my pastor about this concerning the dressing in our church, and then the pastor just simply quoted this verse to me. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. This is a famous argument used by them. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. Oh, come on. Really? All right, so here's one of their arguments that they're going to use. So notice, the passage reads, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. <laughs> so, it's not, so it seems to show that outward appearance does not matter. God's only looking at the heart. 
So that's their justification for how they dress. So they feel like that outward appearance does not really matter. What matters is just the heart. That's what they're going to claim. But you know what the simple answer to that is that, look at Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We're going to look at Mark chapter 7, and then we'll read verse 20. Mark chapter 7, and then we'll read verse 20. Let me give you an easy example here, okay? Let's say that I came, and then you all watch me online, and then you see this kid with piercing on his nose, ripped jeans, and then teaching you the Bible. I wonder how many grown adults with, and elderly people are going to think of that when they watch me online. Well, God knows my heart, right? So he knows I'm being sincere and honest, so it doesn't care what they think, right? See, that's what the point of the verse is. The point of the verse is God might look at your heart, but guess what? Men are going to judge you by your outward appearance. That's the point. You know why? Because men can't read your mind, can't read your heart. You think you go to a job interview and you come with the piercing on your nose and then ripped jeans that... You know, God judges me from the heart, so I know that this boss will be so sincere and look at my heart. No, they're going to look at your outward appearance. That's the realistic world that we live in. Now, if you're going to set forth a good testimony of Jesus Christ, you can't just keep justifying, they don't know my heart, they don't know my heart. No, they judge by your outward actions, not just appearance, but even actions. And through that, they judge what kind of person you are. That's why when you're doing soul winning, you got to use more wisdom and love and understanding with people, not just be a jerk and bash them on the head concerning about hell. See that? Why? Because people judge outwardly. So you got to use your head on that one. By the way, if you're truly sincere in the heart, it's going to show outwardly. Yep. So what you outwardly show shows what's really in your heart. Right. Look at Mark chapter 7, verse 20. The Bible says right here, And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. Right. It's corrupt outwardly. Why? Because it comes from within. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, Wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Now I want you to look at I want you to look at verse 21 through 22 and see if any of those sins in that list applies to you before you pick out an item of your dressing. An evil eye, fornication, evil thought. When you pick out that item of dressing, I wonder if you're thinking, I'm doing this to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, brother. Or you're doing this, that way the younger generation can look at me as more cool and hip. Come on. That's why these preachers dress like five-year-olds. You notice that? These Hillsong pastors and these guys, they all dress like five-year-olds. I kid you not. I thought this guy was in his... Uh, I, well, who's that... Uh, one of you brethren would know this pastor's name. You know, he was Justin Bieber's pastor. What, what's Carl Lentz. Lentz, yes, Carl Lentz. Uh, he was in this interview with these bunch of liberals, and then, they, and then they found out from his age that he's older than he looks, and they're like, I didn't know you were that old. You know why? Because he dressed up like a kid. That's why. Because he dressed up like a teenager that they couldn't tell he was a pastor. One of them even said, I can't even tell you're a pastor. And then Lenz took that like as pride. Yeah. Like this was a, that this was a, that he's complimenting him. Wicked. No. You know why he took that as a compliment? Because it was evidence he picked that item of dressing to fit in with them. That's right. Not something in a way that pleases God as a God-fearing pastor. See, it shows from your heart what you're dressed up in. Right. All right, let's also look at Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35. Now here's the last rule concerning about proper dressing. And oh man, people just throw a tirade on this one. I mean, I am going to be so unpopular if I keep going around, Come on. keep coming here. But here's the fourth one. So we see one, we see two, and then we see three. Now, the fourth thing is this, which is why your pastor puts on this monkey suit. Do you think he's, oh, to joy, I want to dress up like this? Are you kidding me? Do you know how much time I would save not to dress up like this? 
I don't want to dress up like this, especially since you know my busy schedule. I'm too busy. I don't want to dress up like this. I just want to come out after studying or just come out of bed and just come over here and teach to you. All right? I'd come over here in my pajamas if I had the freedom to do so. But see, why does your pastor dress up like this? Because here are some passages that you need to think about. Look at Genesis chapter 35, verse 2. Now notice that the Bible says right here, concerning about dressing, the fourth rule is that when you're coming to worship God, it's common sense. Common sense, you're going to pick out a dressing that's professional, formal attire, not your usual casual everyday wear. So even though the casual dressing is not sin, like wearing jeans or a t-shirt, but when I come to worship God, I know better that I can't just come in like a comfortable casual fit. I got to come out with uh, formal attire. Why? Because I'm worshiping God. Uh, I don't believe in that. Well, look at Genesis 35 too. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean. And notice that they're casual, everyday, normal garments. What did Jacob say? And what? Change your garments. He wants them to put on some special attire, not something that they just normally wear. Why? And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God. See, they're going to worship God. See that? Now look at 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. King David, isn't he known a man after God's own heart? Now look at why he was. Because he had common sense that when I come to worship God, I'm going to put on my best. That's why he won God's heart. How much do you really love God when you come to church? Something you got to ask yourself. You know why I dress up like this? Not because I love to do it. I hate to do this. You know why I dress up like this? Because I love Jesus Christ. I believe that he deserves the glory. So if I have to wear a monkey suit and onliners call me Masonic for wearing an Egyptian tie or a phallic symbol like they would all call it, whatever, I have to dress up my best for Jesus Christ. Oh, so you're going to be a Mason? You know what the simple answer to that is? Okay? You all think that whenever you see some Catholic or Mason believing a certain doctrine that Christians do, wearing something that a Christian would do, that automatically it's attributed to Masons and Catholics. How do you not know that the reason why Masons dress up like this, Catholics dress up like this, because they know that's proper attire, so they want to dress their best for their false pagan religions. And not only that, you got to realize this. Satan's people are going to copycat what God's people do as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to use your head for crying out loud. If you're going to make a big deal about pagan days, Masonic days, then you know what you should do? You should not even live the entire week. You know why? Because Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they all came from paganism and pagan gods. Right. What are you going to do then, huh? See, it's hypocrisy. Quit using your credit cards, hypocrite. You know why? That's, from the, that's making way for the mark of the beast system. Oh, right. You didn't know that? Yep. Stop using YouTube yep. and the internet watching us online. You know why? Because that technology yep. is all Satan's system as well. Yep. See, so don't, so don't act hypocritical that, oh, because Satan's people are doing it, you shouldn't do it. No, then you know what's going to happen? You're going to live in the middle of the woods, butt naked, doing nothing. <laughs> Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 20. All right, so Genesis chapter 35. And then we read verse 2 through 3. And then I want you to also remember 2 Samuel chapter 12 and then verse 20. So these two verses are going to be helpful to you. The Bible says, And Samuel said unto the people... Uh, oh, I'm reading 1 Samuel. I'm sorry. I knew that that looked wrong. Yeah. All right. So 2 Samuel. Hold on one second. Da, 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 da. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself. Notice what he did. He wasn't wearing his everyday common normal apparel. What did he do? And changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house, and when he re required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. So notice that because he was worshiping God, he realized, I better dress differently. Now, 
Like I mentioned to you before, if you're going to get upset about dressing up like this at church, it is a crying shame to me that when you come across a very special day in your life, like graduation, that you would dress up like this. Right. When you go to a job interview to pre represent your company, you would dress up like this. That when you work at a prestigious office as a lawyer or a government leader or a politician, you would dress up like this. And you don't whine and complain about that. But when you're coming to church where you're worshiping the Holy of Holies, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that you think that, that you whine and complain about it. That's a crying shame. That's a crying shame. See, so that's something you got to think and pray about. All right, let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. So apparently, I guess I'm not going to really cover music today, but there's a lot of documentations on music that we're going to cover next week. So we'll cover that next week. But let's wrap up the dressing here. Now, you notice for a very particular subject, it can go like two lessons long for a particular issue. You know what? That's how ingrained we are in the flesh. That's sad. So I have to cover every kind of thought and argument that would go on a person's mind here. All right. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. And that brings up the idea. If you can wear respectable attire around men of respectable high rank, you should never do less with God because he deserves the best or even better. Look at that. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the what? Preeminence. If graduation takes the preeminence above worshiping God at church, you better get right with God. If working as a lawyer takes a preeminence above worshiping God in the dressing, you better get right with God. If going to prom, which is like a happy day in your life, in a worldly event like that, that you dress up like this, or celebrities and Hollywood stars and etc., going to a concert, etc., where you all start to dress up like this, and that takes a preeminence more than worshiping God, you better check your heart. All right, who takes the preeminence of your life? Now look at Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 8. And then we're going to have to close it here. Zephaniah chapter 1. And then we'll read verse 8. The common neo-evangelical argument that you're going to hear is all these dress codes are not found in the Bible. That's what they're going to bring up to you. They're just your opinions, pastor. I don't think God is going to be really upset with the way I dress. Then I want to close it with Zephaniah 1.8, and I want you to go home and pray about that and see if God does not really care about that. Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 8. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will Punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with what? Strange apparel. Wow. If you don't think that God's not going to judge and get upset and even punish the way that you dress, why would he do that with these people right here? See? Things that are different and strange to his standards of dressing... You don't think he's going to get upset about that? Now you go home and pray about that. What does strange mean? Strange means other. It means different. Yeah. So you got to look at how God's standard of dressing is. And if it's from deviating, see, from the standard, different, other from the standard, what does that mean in English dictionary, which we all don't have common sense of? That means strange. That means strange apparel. All right. So you can get upset at me if you want, but... Look, if God starts to get to you in your life and gets upset at you, then don't get upset at me. I'm trying to rescue you from a lot of heartache and problems here. All right, your homework assignment will be posted at, at the end of this video when I post it. I hope you've been watching them. Please keep up with your homework assignments because they cover more than half of the religions that I taught to you here, okay? So watch your homework assignments, write notes, keep notes on that one. And then uh, we should be able to wrap up apologetics real soon. And then I'll be able to cover some other stuff in intermediate discipleship.
Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers, open our eyes more to the truth. And Heavenly Father, you know how much I care for the people, even though I may be hard, but I'm doing this because I'm trying to hit that flesh, Lord, that is ingrained within us. And that needs to be, ex that needs to be opened up and preached hard. And people need to feel the conviction from the Holy Spirit. And I pray that the conviction is working, Lord, and that you'll help all of us change and live our lives that will better glorify thee. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that He can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what He did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that He died, buried, and resurrected so that His blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through His blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.